Are you a Seventh-day Adventist? I'd like to question you about your faith. You know, Scripture says that we should always be ready to give an answer to anyone who questions us about our faith, right? Uh, when I question most Seventh-day Adventists, they try to run, just like Jehovah Witnesses. They got to go. They don't want to argue because what I'm saying is negative against their doctrine. They just got to get out of there. You know, here's the here's the deal. God says, he that is of God receiveth gladly the words of God. So if you have a, a problem with God's word and you resist God's word, God says, uh, you know, he that turns away his ear from hearing the, the law, even his prayer should be an abomination. And here's the thing, man. If you turn away your ear from hearing the word of God, your prayer is an abomination. Alan White taught this doctrine of soul sleep. And if you ask the average Seventh-day Adventist, they'll tell you that there's no hell. The reason they don't believe in hell is because Ellen White said so. So what they do is they nullify the Word of God where Jesus said there's a real hell in Luke 16. There was a rich guy who was sumptuously arrayed and, uh, <clears throat> and there was a poor man named Lazarus that was laid full of sores at the rich man's gate, desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, after a space of time, it says that the rich man died, the poor man died, the poor man's name was Lazarus. <clears throat> it wasn't the same Lazarus that Jesus rose from the dead, because that Lazarus was taken care of by his sisters until he died, okay? But this Lazarus was a poor beggar guy that but he loved God, just a poor guy, vagabond, nobody of this earth, but he loved God, man, and he was taken to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died in Luke 16. You can read this yourself. Jesus never lied. The rich man also died, and in hell, <clears throat> he lifted up his eyes, being in anguish. You can say, well, that, that means show, or that means death, or that, well, let's see what really is going on. You can call it what you want, but let's see the elements of what's going on. <clears throat> and in hell he lifted up his eyes being ang in anguish and he saw Abraham and he saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom in the midst of Abraham and he said Father Abraham please send Lazarus that he may but dip the tip of his finger into a drop of water and place it in my, on my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame you can say this is Shoal you can say this is a trash dump outside Jerusalem you can try to theologically explain all this away but the fact is, the guy was burning in a fiery hell, begging for a drop of water. Jesus never lied. Isaiah 53 said there was no deceit found in his mouth. You know, you're accusing Jesus of lying in order to support the words of your false prophetess, Ellen White. Because Jesus never lied. And this was not a parable like some seven Adventists say. No parable ever gave a proper name. Abraham, Lazarus. This is an, this is an exact description of an eyewitness account of a word-for-word -word conversation between Abraham and a rich man burning in hell. If this didn't happen, then Jesus is lying, and Jesus never lied, okay? Father Abraham, please send Lazarus that he may but dip the tip of his finger into a drop of water, for I am in anguish in this flame. And Abraham said, said he said, Son, remember in your lifetime you lived sumptuously in a ray while Lazarus was being tormented, and now you're being tormented while he's being comforted. And beside all this, there's a great gulf fixed. There's a great wall, a great chasm between you and us that no one can come from you to us, neither from us to you. And this rich man burning in hell, there's people burning in hell right now that are scared that their loved ones are going to go there too. Listen to his attitude. He said, well, please send someone to warn my five brothers. For I have five, mother, five brothers at my father's house, lest they come to this place of torment. Abraham said, your, your brothers have Moses and the prophets right here. There's Moses and the prophets right here. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, no, Abraham. No, 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 they will not hear them. But if you'll send someone back from the dead, surely they should be persuaded. And Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, neither shall they be persuaded, though shall, when shall rise from the dead. And it was a prophecy about Jesus. Because Jesus said, if you were if you if you were Abraham's seed, you would believe me. Okay? And and here's the thing, man. 
when you nullify the word by your tradition, and Seventh-day Adventists do this, man, they're guilty of this. Jesus said, well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. He said, these people draw near to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How bit in vain do they teach for doctrine the commandments of men. For laying aside the word of God, you nullify the word by your tradition. Now you can go study what that word nullify means. It means to make it of no effect. When you love some certain doctrine that you've been taught so much that you're not willing to change, you're not willing to study out the word to see if that doctrine is actually accurate, out of pride, and, and you know, they, they pump you up with pride in Seven Adventists, man. They teach you that you're the true church. You're the remnant church. You're the only ones that keep the fourth commandment. That's what they teach you, okay? But you don't keep the fourth commandment, man. It's a lie. The prime minister during the Greek Olympic Games several years ago, he walked all the way to the games. You know why he walked all the way to the games? Because it was Sabbath. Okay? He wouldn't dare drive or be driven because he'd be breaking the Sabbath. And you guys run around bragging that you keep the Sabbath. You know, you don't keep the Sabbath, man. According to, according to the law, if you're under the law, if you're placing yourself under the law, which you are, because you're trusting the Sabbath to save you. You do too, man. You, you can say it with your mouth, no, we're trusting Christ. That's a lie, man. You, you, you're condemned in your heart if you wash dishes on the Sabbath, if you buy chocolate milk on the Sabbath. And here's the thing, man. You're the slave children that Paul spoke of that persecute we who are freeborn by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You're not trusting Jesus Christ to save you. You can say with your mouth that you do, but in your heart you're condemned if you do certain things on the Sabbath. So you're really trusting Sabbath keeping to save you. And Christ, Christ has become of no effect, Paul said. Unto you, whosoever you are, that are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. If you're trusting the law to save you, you have fallen from grace, according to Scripture. And uh, that means you were once part of grace, but you've fallen from it. When you, when you first fell in love with Jesus and you started trusting him, but then you got into some legalistic cult that uh, maybe you've been raised in it, I don't know. But the thing is, man, I was raised in a cult, too. I was raised in a false religion. And here's the thing, man. I love my mom and dad, but just because you're raised in a false religion doesn't mean it's the truth. God says, let, let the word of God be true, but every man be found a liar. And here's, here's a big question for you, man. Are you truly born again? Ellen White taught that it's wrong for you to say you're saved. The scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And, uh, man, Ellen White taught a lot of lies, man. She taught that, that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. And uh, one of her followers, a guy named Charles Taze Russell, sat under her ministry he was also a deceived follower of William Miller. They were all deceived followers of William Miller, okay? She sold her stuff. They all sold their stuff. A thousand people sold their stuff, moved right around Miller, and were waiting for Jesus to come back at any moment in 1843 or 1844. It never happened. William Miller was a false prophet, and uh, he admitted he was wrong, but his followers, most of them fell away on October 22nd, after his followers set a second date of October 22nd, 1844. And they prayed around a rock and ate their last meal. And they were expecting Jesus to come that day. And guess what? He didn't come that day, man. Jesus said, no man knows the hour of the day, only the Father. And here's the thing, man. <clears throat> that day, most, the day after that, most of his followers fell away, except a small group were too ashamed to go back to their family members and admit they were wrong. And this is in your doctrine today if you're a Seventh Adventist. They were too ashamed to admit they were wrong. So they made a lie up to cover themselves and said, well, Miller wasn't wrong. We've studied deeper in our Bibles. We've determined that October 22nd, 1844 was the day Jesus entered into the Holy of Holies, began his final work as mediator between God and man. That's a lie, man. Jesus entered into the Holy of Holies in between the time he saw Mary in the garden and said, Do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. And the next time he appeared and said, Go ahead and touch me, Thomas. 
go ahead and touch me. And he, and he turned right around and said, I have been given all authority over heaven and earth. He told his disciples that. And between the time he saw Mary and said, don't touch me, I have not yet ascended to the Father, that's when he entered in the Holy of Holies. That's when he, that passion play you see in Daniel, where, I, where it says, I saw one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and he came to the Ancient of Days. And there was given him dominion and power and glory and a kingdom. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom which shall not pass away. And his, and his dominion that which shall not cease. That beautiful passion play of you seeing Jesus receive all authority. Just like in Revelations 5 where there was only one worthy to receive the scroll from him who, who, came, who sat on the throne. It was the lamb that had been slain. That passion play happened between the time that Jesus, after he rose from the dead, and appeared to Mary and said, Do not touch me, I have not yet ascended to my father. And the next time he appeared and told Thomas to touch him. And here's the thing. It didn't happen on October 22nd, 1844. This is cult teaching, okay? And uh, this is uh, kryptonite stuff. This is, this is Joseph Smith saying that there's inhabitants living on the moon and they were fair to look upon, okay? You know, dressed like Quakers. Actually, Alan White said there was inhabitants living on Jupiter and Saturn and they were fair to look upon. She said that. And uh, James, her husband, in, in A Word to the Little Flock, that book, he said, Ellen didn't even know those planets had seven moons. He endorsed her teaching. But Ellen White taught that, the, that she was taken to a planet that had seven moons. Okay. Later, James in, in his book said it was Jupiter and Saturn. And here's the thing, men. And that there was inhabitants living there, and they were fair to look upon. Well, according to NASA, she was wrong, man. There's no one living on Jupiter or Saturn. Ellen White said that England would join the Civil War. This is in uh, early writings. England would join the Civil War and humble this great nation into the dust. She was alive during the Civil War, okay? Did England join the Civil War? No. Did they? You know, if you want, if you want evidence of this, I can give you a page and chapter of what book she wrote. It's called Early Writings, okay? First edition. And, uh, and here's the thing, man. England did not join the Civil War. What does God say about someone who prophesies in his name and it comes not to pass? Disregard them, I have not sent them. And listen to this, man. When Ellen White, right after Miller's false prophecy, most people don't know this, most seven Adventists don't know this, Ellen White set a second date, okay? She said, she said that Jesus would return in, in the first reaping of the hay in 1845, okay? You can look this up on the internet. There's a pastor's wife named Lucinda. She wrote a letter to Ellen White. She was corresponding back and forth. Ellen White responded back and said, when, when Jesus didn't come back in the first reaping of the hay in 1845, she said, she said, why is it that your vision failed? And Ellen White said, my vision failed because God first spoke it to me in the language of Cana, which at the time I did not understand. But now God's revealed to me it'll happen in the second reaping of the hay. The second reaping of the hay happened in 1845. Jesus never returned. She was a false prophet. And here's the dangerous thing. You can say, well, we don't always listen to everything she says. That's a lie, man. Every doctrine you have in your, in your doctrinal statement is based on her teachings, man, or it's slanted or biased towards her teachings. And here's the thing. You guys teach that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Charles Taz Russell sat underneath her ministry. He took that same teaching that Jesus is Michael the Archangel, and he's teaching it today through his multitude of cult that he has called the Watchtower Society. He's the founder of it. He came from Ellen White's teachings. He sat under her ministry. You want you wonder why Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in hell and don't believe and believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel? Ellen White taught him that. Okay, and look how far that lie is spun. They teach now that Jesus is Michael the Archangel, became Jesus Christ on earth, and now he's nothing more than Michael the Archangel. Okay, that's what they teach, man. Seven Seven Adventism taught them that. It wasn't called the Seven Day Adventists back then. They were called Millerites. Okay. But uh, Ellen White taught him that lie, and you're still repeating that lie. You could be anointed of God. You could be preaching the Word of God and flowing in the Holy Spirit. And the moment you speak one of those stinking doctrinal lies, man, the Lord is withdrawing himself from you. He doesn't endorse it, okay? I'll tell you what he does endorse. He, he endorses what you preach about the gospel of Jesus Christ, about the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing you from all sins. He endorses what you preach about the truth of the gospel, okay? And here's the thing. He, he, when you speak a lie, you could be some anointed charismatic preacher who thinks he has all his doctrine right, start speaking about the preacher of rapture, man. The Lord's just, with, you know, people clap you on, man. But the Lord just drew himself from you, man. 
And here's why. He doesn't endorse lies, man. You know, our generation is so fouled up. Every denom denomination there is, man, has bad doctrine. And if you're not, if you don't have enough integrity to study your own doctrine to see if it's true or not, then uh, you're just a puppet. You are, you know. And here's the thing, man. God says to study to show yourself, you know, approved. A workman need not ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. And, uh, man, the seven Adventists are a cult, and they're a legalistic cult. And I'm going to tell you a cool little story, okay? It's about a guy named Charlie. I was working one time as a carpenter, and uh, Charlie was my laborer, and he was a Seventh day Adventist. And uh, every day, every day at lunch, we'd go to the little store down the road and get something to drink. And man, I'd pass out some Salvation tracks, you know. And Charlie started getting encouraged, and he'd give, he'd say, "Give me some of them," and he'd pass them out too. And I'd share stories about awesome things I've seen Jesus do, and you know, carrying across the around the world, and leading people to Jesus and watching God do miracles. and Man, Charlie fell in love with Jesus. He's a seven Adventist now, watch. One Monday morning, Charlie's all depressed. And I said, man, you okay? He goes, I'm all right, man. I said, no, you're not, man. What's wrong? He said, man, my dad's been attacking me. Now, this is a seven Adventist family, okay? I said, what do you mean? He said, the other day ago, my dad said, uh, look at Charlie there. He thinks he's all holy, holy. And he bought a chocolate milk on the Sabbath. You hear that? Look at Charlie there. He thinks he's all holy, holy, and he bought a chocolate milk on the Sabbath. His dad was persecuting him. Charlie didn't run around the house saying, I'm holy, holy. He, his dad saw his son for the first time in his life, falling in love with Jesus, praying, seeking the, the Lord, reading the Word of God, excited about Jesus. And he was persecuting him because he didn't have that. You know what he had? He had the law. You know, he was a slave child that Paul mentioned in Scripture that persecuted we that are freeborn. And the slave child answers to the law, which represented as Sinai, Paul said. It was an analogy Paul gave. But the freeborn answers to Jerusalem, which, which is above, which is the mother of us all. We were conceived before the throne of God by faith when we say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Save me. Set me free. 